um, and I will go through, um, I'm going to pop my slides up so you can see them as well. Um, so this is a session called, um, provocatively called, hi, gender studies as well, great to hear. Okay, so this is um, provocatively called viral feminisms. Uh, studying gender, sexuality and law in times of crisis. And what I'm hoping to do is bridge uh, both the programs within the School of Law uh, and the School of Interdisciplinary Studies that cross uh, between gender and law in particular, probably with a slightly kind of uh, broader focus on the gender components of that uh, rather than necessarily uh, the legal bits but that will come up and I, I will talk to my courses which include the legal component as we go through uh, and which Chani can also talk to uh, who's one of my current students uh, who's here with us today. Um, so why viral feminisms? Well first of all I have to admit that I stole my title from my colleague uh, Yasmin Gunatananam who is uh, a colleague at Goldsmiths University and uh, and it came up in a discussion we were having, and I um, I, uh, I thought it was a, just a really kind of neat capture of um, the potential for existing feminist literature to perhaps be framed as a response to some of the kind of current crisis modes that we find ourselves in. Yasmin's work is uh, on feminist methods, uh, race, migrants, care, debility, and frailty and is just a massive inspiration on my own work and uh, there'll be some links to some of her writing uh, as we go through. But the, in, in framing the lecture uh, viral feminisms I also wanted to reflect on I guess two interrelated aspects of what I think we might all be experiencing at the moment and that is this kind of very um, prominent calling um, of for a kind of reimagining of the world through um, through the idea of care and community. I've sat with human rights scholars uh, and colleagues that saw us talking about how they see the end of the pandemic as a moment when we might rethink uh, how we build our communities and how we might centre care. I have to say I was a little bit shocked when they said this because I was like, oh, have you not read any feminist literature? You don't need to rethink the world to centre care and community, you, there are plenty of blueprints for doing this already. Um, and I think this is most particularly in the histories of black feminist writing. Um, so my colleague at Queen Mary uh, University, Aziza Johnson, writes in response um, to COVID-19. And I, again, I've got a link coming up on a slide. And this is Aziza's words. And as I feel my rage bubbling over, of this superficial and delayed concern with health and well-being. I know that rage is the last emotion they want to process from a disabled black Muslim woman. And this is in a, uh, a blog post that she wrote about her own kind of struggles at the moment dealing with simultaneously with cancer uh, and COVID-19, but also the politics of race, politics of care, politics of voice. Um, and it really brought home to me, um, you know, that so many um, feminist writings have long kind of considered many of the themes that are being pushed to the forefront at the moment. Um, and the second element is a, in kind of theorising care, vulnerability and different ways of living. I guess we could pick up on the viral aspect of that virus being something that is kind of spread in a more of a horizontal, you know, this is what's kind of uh, challenging our politicians and political structures, which are so used to kind of a top down and imposed uh, structure and instead we have knowledge uh, about care, knowledge about the disease that's kind of traveling in these horizontal ways um, that again already exists, already exists in the framing of feminist, queer, trans, critical race scholarship. Um, so uh, perhaps what we need to do, and this is I guess the theme of what I'm talking about, look to the peripheries of our dominant knowledge frames uh, if we want to imagine the world anew. So rather than this is a starting point, perhaps this is a, a looking back point for many feminist scholars. So in terms of who I am, uh, just of a quick kind of brief uh, picking up on that, uh, I'm a reader in Gender Studies and International Law at SOAS. Um, 
So, um, so well, welcome to all of you just joining the session. It, it, we've only just begun. We have a bit of time. Um, and I hold a peculiar place at SOAS in the sense that I work across two different departments. Um, I was originally employed in the School of Law, but I'm also now employed in the Centre for Gender Studies. I have a very close working relationship with both departments. Um, and part of the work that I've done is uh, been set up a MA in gender studies and law, uh, as well as an LLM in law and gender. So nearly all of my courses have some students from the law school, some students from gender studies. Um, and Ashanti, some students from other departments as well certainly join us uh, on some of our on some of the courses. But I'm sure you've already looked and seen that we also have a, a kind of much broader a range of gender studies modules that many of you might be interested in. My own research focuses on predominantly collective security and feminist methodologies within international law. And at different moments, I might come up with some of that uh, as we go forward. Um, so I just, uh, for those of you that have just kind of arrived, I also wanted just to in introduce Chandy, Chandy, me again. Uh, do you want to say a quick hi? I think your microphone should be working and just tell us a bit about your degree and your modules. Oh, maybe she's just stepped away. Oh, yeah. So, oh, you're there. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Chandani. I'm one of Gina's students. I'm doing the LLM in Human Rights, Conflict and Justice. And this, well, it's only a one year program. So, this is my last term. And if anyone has any kind of student related questions they want to um, ask me, do let me know. I think you can message in the chat. Um, to me individually, I'm not sure, um, or I don't know if Gina, we can work out a way that I can answer questions offline after the thing's finished. Yes, yeah. uh, so we can have a question section at the end, or if you want to throw questions uh, as we go forward uh, through the chat, that's absolutely fine. Um, and yeah, and I guess um, also you're I, you're taking the gender piece and international law course at the moment. Mm -hmm. So um, how do you find it being in an interdisciplinary classroom? Because I think that's one of the very specific things about gender modules is that we do have very interdisciplinary classrooms, students from across the school. Um, I think it's probably my favourite thing about doing the gender modules is the interdisciplinary nature of the mm -hmm. learning, um, especially at the beginning of the term, you know, when everyone kind of goes around and says, their name, where they're from, and what their kind of background and study is, and what they're studying now, it kind of creates this little microcosm where you get so many different views from so many different places, and you're all still talking about the same topic. And I really think that's the beauty of interdisciplinary classrooms. And I also think, just generally, that um, it's almost a shame that the disciplines are so separate because so much magic comes from where disciplines combine and it's just such a, an apt way of looking at most topics. So I think it's really valuable. Yeah, I think it's also, I really like that last point. I think it um, in particular stops, I guess, as someone that kind of went through a law disciplinary background, mm -hmm. the kind of constraints of that thinking because the co colleagues from different departments sort of or challenge the language or challenge the assumptions within another discipline. I think that's really, really powerful. But also our methodologies. Just want to ask yeah. Sophie, are you all right? I know you've dropped in and out. I've got fine. So I wonder if the connection's not good. Um, send us a message in the chat if you need some support in the background. Uh, and I've probably got someone that can help you, Sophie. Um, I know you just see you're now on your third attempt at entering the room. Thanks, Chandy. So I want to move on. Uh, this is what I'm my outline for what I'm going to go through now. Um, so I just a very short slide on the more practical side of COVID-19 and so contingency plans, and you know what we're hoping will happen and what will happen if what we hope won't. If what we hope happens can't happen, uh, before I talk a little bit about the kind of gender sexuality law study that you can do at SOAS and then a kind of much more in-depth digging into the kind of feminisms and gender studies uh, that we do at SOAS uh, as well. Okay, so just quickly, uh, first of all, just so you all know, uh, obviously it's probably at the forefront of your mind. Um, and you probably or may or may not know that term three at SOAS 
for this current year. Uh, so we run on a three term um, program. We've just finished term two. The last week of that was online and all of term three is going to be online, including our assessments, any lectures, any outstanding uh, tutorials or student meet meetings, including uh, around dissertation. So in that sense, uh, it's been a bit rushed, but we've certainly managed to kind of, I hope, kind of move the programs online. Um, we, uh, our hope is and our expectation is that we'll be on campus uh, in October, uh, October for the new academic year. Although, of course, uh, students come for welcome week in the last week of September. And you see the aspect there. I'm sorry, it's off the slide. Um, actually for anyone taking the MA in Gender Studies in Law or an MA in Law, so if you don't have a law degree already, but taking a law program, you would be expected to come earlier in September for the professional law course. But for all of those programs at this moment, we're working to be on campus uh, with backup kind of uh, processes around, you know, if some of our cohort court aren't there, uh, mechanisms for people to keep up to date with the learning through recorded lectures such as this, uh, or, um, you know, if heaven forbid we're, we're not on campus at all, uh, an alternative online learning practice. Uh, we're running our summer schools uh, and our English uh, language learning over the summer also this, this year. If you're super, super anxious, you might want to look at the MA in Gender, Sexuality and Global Politics, which is our first uh, SOAS Gender Studies full MA that will be online uh, and the first int intake uh, is due to commence and join us in October 2020 uh, and does enjoy, does include a new module on gender sexuality and law which we're currently uh, finessing uh, and should have up online soon. If you want some information on that I think the best thing is to just email me directly. Great so uh, I've, I've, there, there are different ways that you might be coming at gender for example, I, I know some of you are looking to come onto other programs but take some of our gender studies modules, which is absolutely fine. Uh, as we were just talking about, it's one of the things that makes many of our um, courses so rich. Um, and we have many students across di different disciplines that join us. If you are enrolling in the Center for Gender Studies, we run three different programs. Uh, the MA in Gender Studies and Law, which is the one that I convene. Uh, the MA in Gender Studies, uh, which is our biggest program, and I, and I know some of you have talked to me, uh, mentioned that this is what you're coming to study anyway. And our new MA in Transnational Queer Feminist Politics, uh, which is a kind of a revised version of what was previously called the MA in Gender and Sexuality. Uh, if you're in the School of Law, you might be doing Gender Studies modules through any of our LLL. LLM or MA in law programs, but we do have a specific LLM in gender and law, although it's a little bit more constrained than the gender studies modules. Um, in relation to uh, gender uh, and law in particular, I've got a list of the modules there that you might be taking gender sexuality law, theories and methodologies, gender sexuality law, so the topics which runs off the page, uh, gender peace and international law, gender armed conflict international law. Uh, but I think our broader modules, gendering migration and diaspora, for example, uh, this gender and security in Africa module, all also speak often to kind of legal and political arrangements. Uh, and there is a certain amount of crossover and kind of broader discussion. Um, great. So I wanted to start by uh, thinking in terms of content about how we approach gender and feminism in, uh, at SOAS, um, because I don't think it's always self-evident uh, and what kind of feminist histories, histories of gender uh, we think about. And the notes I've got written here are how we understand gender at SOAS, and I've written intersectional post-colonial knowledge frames and epistemologies. And I guess if we were in a class at the moment, they would be the bits that I wanted you to write down, intersectional, post-colonial uh, knowledge frames and epistemologies. Um, so I'm sorry for the kind of size of the text. I didn't want to leave anything out, but um, in particular, I guess, and, and certainly when I think about gender, sexuality and law, but I think more broadly in the approach to gender at SOAS is a commitment to intersectionality. 
Um, and there's a quote there from Yasmin that uh, who I, I spoke about before in relation to um, the pandemic and COVID-19 in particular, where she says the pandemic is also surfacing long-standing feminist concerns. And I guess this is in part my response to the pandemic as well. These are long-standing feminist concerns around care and community uh, that are bit perhaps being voiced more widespread, at the, more widely at the moment. And she says, and disillusionment with the constraints of heteromasculinist and ableist approaches to bodies and subjectivity, as well as the enduring colonial and racial legacies of method and knowledge economies. Uh, it's a great quote, but it needs a little bit of unpicking. And what does it have to do with it? intersectional feminism? Well, I think uh, it pushes us to think about intersectionality as not a kind of list of identities or kind of means to identity politics. So it's not about claiming a particular label and owning a label. It's more, at lo it's more about looking at how power uh, privileges um, certain identities and reproduces the kind of privilege of certain identities over time uh, with an enduring kind of legacy of both colonial and racial histories. Um, and an intersectional feminist approach, therefore, is interested in the methods and the knowledges that ground power. Uh, intersectionality, of course, as I'm sure you're aware, emerges from critical race writing uh, in the US, uh, particularly the work or the, the, the term itself is framed and phrased by uh, Kimberly Crenshaw in the early 1990s, but critical race feminism in the US uh, extends well beyond uh, uh, Kimberly Crenshaw's work. Uh, and of course, uh, what Crenshaw taught us as critical race feminists do more broadly is that, um, is that gender doesn't operate in isolation. Uh, it help us, operates actually in tandem with other power structures in our communities. And uh, Kimberly Crenshaw was particularly interested in the intersection of race and gender um, and uh, looked at how that intersection between racial discrimination and gender discrimination in the US was more than race plus gender, but that something qualitatively different happens at the intersection of race and gender for racialized and gendered uh, subjects. Um, now, if you've read Crenshaw, if you've read critical black uh, feminisms, critical race feminisms from the US, you'll know that this then isn't uh, a project that is interested in kind of reproducing identities. It's looking at how political, legal, economic structures in and of themselves reproduce and alienate some while empowering others uh, within the structures we already have. Intersectional feminisms today obviously look beyond gender and race, look at sexuality, ableism, uh, religion, ethnicity, uh, and well beyond to articulate and mobilize around the idea of intersectional harms and discrimination interlocking with each other. Um, for feminists interested in law, I think what's most important with uh, from the most important kind of takeaway from this is to appreciate that if we have a gender law reform policy that doesn't think through kind of intersectional privilege and intersectional power, what we reproduce in our gender law reform is the capacity really only for uh, some women to advance and the reproduction of intersectional harms in other spaces uh, so that we find women whose identities otherwise match uh, elite groups in society are often advanced. We have or if we think of this in a more global sense, we see gender law reform being used as a tool that's imposed on some communities uh, rather than others. So it becomes part of civilizing tools. The other aspect of intersectionality for me is always a kind of methodological one. So taking the end of uh, the quote there, uh, it's about thinking about how uh, diverse speaking subjects, uh, to pick up Lark May, Manny's uh, quote in the second part of slide, uh, the diversity of speaking subjects and the forms of expression and treat them, treatment themselves. So I think intersectional politics also asks us to ask about the conditions for speech, the conditions for agency, um, and I'm sure you'll get the slides sent to you after the lecture. 
then when you do what I encourage you to do is to click on this slide which actually has um, has a, a short trailer for uh, Lata Mani's film the politics sorry the poetics of fragility embedded in it and you can um, see Angela Davis there a really very beautiful evocative exploration of fragility which seems I think ever so timely at a moment when of course we're talking about vulnerability and fragility uh, globally, uh, locally, regionally, nationally. Um, and again, it just strikes me that we have some sophisticated theorizing around this within feminist and gender studies, rather than kind of this preoccupation with, oh, there's a new new way of doing community that we're doing at the moment, a new way of doing care. Um, and I want to encourage you to think about that, not just as um, a knowledge framing or who speaks and how we speak, but a deeply embedded kind of reorientating of the methods and the mechanisms uh, from which uh, we enact and kind of uh, build our communities. So uh, moving forward, um, the next slide um, actually picks up how I've been monitoring the, the crisis uh, if we if we see it as a crisis or global pandemic uh, as gendered um, and why would I even question the idea of whether we see it as a crisis this is this half of the slide because there's, there's, there's some excellent feminist writing around how crisis thinking in and of itself is a gendered form of thinking that lends itself towards masculine solutions and embedding kind of a gendered binary uh, in our thinking between masculine and feminist, feminine, not feminist, uh, forms. Uh, and um, I guess this leads to asking the question of how does a program on gender, such as the courses you might do at SARS, but also kind of a theorization of gender, such as intersectionality, as we've been talking about, but also wider approaches such as postcolonial feminisms or transnational feminisms. Uh, such as what we we deal with it, look at it first, deal with a kind of tension between focusing on women's lives and theorizing gender, because to see they're two slightly different things. I don't think they're unrelated, and I think they're really important to think through in our approach. Um, so just surveying the type of literature that's emerging around the gender of COVID-19, I've seen quite a bit of writing on women and disaster responses in the sense of um, who's being cared for, how care is operationalized, who has access to care, uh, gender vulnerabilities. I'm sure we've all seen the kind of reports about raised risks with respect to um, uh, domestic violence in particular, uh, gendered ideas around protection, about who needs protection in the state and just how protection is, uh, is Sort of narrativized uh, in the kinds of public discourses we've seen at the moment and of course uh, a little bit of attention to uh, the idea of women and decision making in crisis times I think there's a, an interesting article going around that sort of looks at I think uh, Prime Minister of Iceland, Norway and uh, New Zealand who are all women and kind of makes a case for their kind of response to the crisis or COVID-19 being different uh, to that of other states, which I found really, really very interesting. Of course, if we focus on women's lives, we always risk, um, we risk essentializing their lives and making some claims that perhaps uh, women are this, or women are biologically in, inclined in this way, or women's nature is such that they are vulnerable and in need of protection, while men are the agents, men are the experts, uh, uh, and then are the decision makers uh, in, the, in the world. Um, so I think this kind of work is really important, perhaps undoes that some of that. And of course, one of the most interesting aspects of COVID-19 is that we've seen uh, more male deaths. So there's a gendered kind of variance, but it's not necessarily creating a vulnerability for women. But what does it mean to talk about women, but actually wanting to theorize gender? And I think that uh, going back to this idea in the former slide about thinking, thinking about power structures and privileging being co-opted into gender. So it's not actually about necessarily finding what what is essential to being a woman, but looking at how our societies organize around gendered modes of operating. 
and that's where I think the second set of uh, the second list of three topics becomes quite important to us. Um, so a reference there, Hilary Charlesworth's famous it's famous for international lawyers anyway. He's um, International Law and Discipline of Crisis, which is in the Modern Law Review, is very easy to find. And uh, it's actually about humanitarian intervention. It's not about um, the kind of disasters and pandemic that we're looking at at the moment. But it, in this piece, she reminds us that this idea of looking at the crisis moment and trying to make a decision during the crisis can neglect the kind of long history of decisions, particularly political and economic history, decisions that have helped contribute to the crisis. So for those of us in the UK, we I think we're watching a kind of uh, a conscious forgetting of the last 10 years of austerity. So austerity politics, which have cut back the resources to our hospitals and our health systems, and the, the role that they are playing in the actually production of crisis at this moment. Now, Charlesworth says crisis thinking is gendered because it forces us often, and she's talking about insecurity and conflict in the humanitarian crisis, forces us towards militarized thinking instead of a politics of the everyday. Uh, of course, COVID-19 is pushing us back into the politics of everyday. Yeah, today, I'm talking to you from my home rather than my workplace, or my home is now my workplace, and all of us are kind of navigating the kind of complexity of the public sphere entering our everyday. So perhaps it will be a moment where we move away from crisis thinking that is gendered and we perhaps pull something different through using tools such as gender as an intersectional tool uh, where it's not enough to just look at women's lives but to think about how women's lives are constructed through the production of gender, race, sexuality, uh, ableism uh, and how they inform the kind of capacity to access resources, to access knowledge, to actually speak and be perceived as holding knowledge or expertise. Um, so um, a crisis think thinking uh, it potentially kind of reconstructs the histories of inequalities, the way that inequalities might already be enshrined and embedded in the structures in which we've got to work within. Uh, assumptions about who works, how we work, uh, where expertise lies. And I think uh, COVID-19 has, of course, been very interesting, you know, in sense of who's been uh, articulated and identified as an essential worker at this moment in time, uh, who we rely on from supermarket employees to the cleaners uh, that keep going to work. Although I have to say, I've seen very, very little written about the cleaners uh, the cleaners in hospitals, the cleaners uh, in number 10 Downing Street, um, who are doing, uh, who are still going to work uh, throughout uh, the whole um, pandemic. So uh, the next slide uh, puts a couple of references for you. Um, so what I wanted to do was to give you some starting points to go and do some further reading. So one of the ones that I've referred to a little bit already uh, is the Feminist Review blog. I have to admit my own bias. I'm part of the Feminist Review Collective. Um, and we sat down a couple of weeks ago and talked about, you know, how we wanted to respond. And I think we wanted to pay attention to feminist methods uh, and feminist practices of working around care and community. So uh, Yasmin's piece that I drew on before, uh, you can, if you, once you get, you can either Google Feminist Review blog and you'll find it quickly. Or you once you've got the slides, you can click on the link embedded in the slide. Um, and so Yasmin talks about feminist method uh, as necessary and as a part of uh, the work that we might all be doing at this moment. Um, a much broader reading list, the second one that I encourage you to have a look at, this is by my colleague, uh, Owino Oketch in um, the Centre for Gender Studies, who's put together a feminist reading list on care, crisis and pandemics. Uh, this is not a collection of writing on COVID-19, but a collection of writing on um, disaster politics, on pan pandemics that already exist. This kind of recognition, we don't necessarily need to start anew. So uh, the list goes through writing on Ebola, HIV AIDS uh, and of course Hurricane Trina as well as other uh, 
um, you know, big crisis that we've seen in recent history. Um, and of course, the communities that are writing this literature, where we can find the expertise uh, from Africa, LGBTQIA communities, uh, African American communities. Um, so I think it's about a kind of it's it's about remembering when they're like, wow, we're at this kind of moment where things might change quite radically. We might be theorizing or re-theorizing care and community to not forget. Um, the knowledge on the peripheries of mainstream writing, even mainstream writing on gender, uh, where we can see quite different kinds of accounts and possibilities already have been thought and kind of problematized. The third one is in response to coronavirus, and I have to say it's one of the most satisfying references I've found along my journeys in the last few uh, weeks, uh, and it's written by a group that titled it uh, Asian American Feminist Antibodies Care in the Time of Coronavirus. Uh, it's very beautiful um, design uh, that's online. Again, the link is in the slide, but you can also um, probably Google it to find it as well. Uh, drawings, very short pieces, interjections, and kind of interruptions on how we imagine care. Uh, and which bodies receive and give care, particularly in the American context, but also looking a little bit outside that. Also some more practical knowledge as well. So I love this kind of uh, rethinking our methodologies uh, in, in that piece as well. The last piece from Jasper Poir, who you might be familiar with, uh, is an older piece again, Homo Nationalism as Assembly. Uh, viral Travels Effective Sexuality is really, um, and I'm sorry that the full, um, Full, uh, full title has just scrolled off my page, so I'm just going to write here. It's actually in the Jindal Global Law Review. Again, into Google, and you will find it online. I think it's volume four. Yeah, you can see volume four is already there. Uh, so just pop that into the chat for you as well. Um, but I think the, the reason I want you to maybe think about reading something like Poire's writing is thinking about the role of sexuality and the politics of sexuality uh, as, again, already theorizing many of the things that so many of us are facing, experiencing firsthand, or maybe contemplating and reflecting uh, at this uh, during the, the pandemic. And the first of those is um, how we theorize care. And of course, if you want to theorize care, you can't, you can't not look to uh, radical uh, black feminist writing, uh, writers such as Audre Lorde, um, you know, and pay attention to how they articulated a theory of care that is both entwined to a theory of sexuality, a feminism, uh, and an anti-racism pro uh, project. These are theorizations of care that move beyond essentialism. Um, and what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that um, I think when we theorize care, what we're not saying is that Women are natural caregivers, that there's something in a, in a female psyche that produces a, an affinity with care, but rather that within feminist politics, there is a deep uh, theorizing of care. For example, when we talk about this uh, in the editorial collective that I belong to, Feminist Review, one of the things we talk about is care as responsibility, uh, and that one of the ways that we invoke Care amongst the feminist collective is through taking responsibility for the work that we take on, taking responsibility for the collective kind of life and space which we, which we enter. So care is work rather than something intrinsic. That care is an, a choice in the way that we uh, build a feminist space and what we pay attention to, as opposed to something that is uh, intrinsically or essentially feminine or associated with women. Um, the second point on kinship, uh, I think uh, the best writing on kinship comes through queer projects that theorize alternatives to the heteronormative family. Uh, the idea of queer, queer kin as a chosen active space of kinship. Um, and as well, many of us are stuck in our homes, maybe on our own, maybe in family networks that we maybe otherwise no longer choose to spend so much time within, uh, or maybe in friendship groups that we have unexpectedly be constrained uh, within and constrained by. 
And I do think one of the things we might see is a theorising of kinship, a re-theorising of kinship. But what I would argue is that, in fact, we might start by looking queer kind of understandings of kinship, uh, someone like Jasper Poir's writing around the affective uh, and, and the role of um, the production of sexualities that's not about subjectivity, not about identity politics, moving beyond rights frameworks uh, and thinking about how knowledge kind of moves troubles in our communities and choosing alternative spaces for kin. And for me, this is related to ideas around community, but what I want to talk about here is uh, theorising community through transnational feminisms, uh, which is much of the work. Uh, that informs uh, the writing that I think and, and undertakings that we um, draw into the Centre for Gender Studies and the kind of gender modules that you do at SOAS. But for me, transnational feminism is about horizontal accounts of activism, histories of kind of mobilising from the local to the global, which is of course what we're seeing at this moment, a kind of horizontal functioning of community where there is, um, uh, in a sense, um, you know, what, who's around you, who's closest to you has become uh, incredibly important. I know uh, in my own street, there is a kind of renewed sense of community through a local uh, social media group that allows us to connect while we're all constrained and confined to our homes. Um, but of course, these aren't new. Transnational feminisms have always done this. And I guess we can look also into uh, very, very recently in London, the Grenfell Tower, and the kinds of theorising and voicing and agency uh, that's been expressed uh, through the activism there. Uh, refugee support structures, again, we theorise from the local to the global, but always hold these ideas around care and kinship about how we take responsibility, how we provide and who we see as our kin uh, around us. Uh, and of course, violence uh, against women networks, which have functioned for a long time from the local to the global. And, and by example, I mean, for example, um, violence against women and women's shelters, of course, have work at a local level. They support local women. Uh, they take in uh, those most vulnerable, but they also knowledge share. They work in networks global and regional, well beyond. So this kind of horizontal kind of traveling of knowledge uh, it long exists in international feminist activism. And as a lawyer, I know, and an international lawyer, I know the power of those local networks. They uh, inform and, um, you know, are heard often at an, at an international level, although they're grounded very much in local understandings of power and privilege and navigating that and kind of responding and challenging to that. And so then number five, the sort of fifth area where we might go back to feminist histories, feminist reading lists, as writing is around security, insecurity, militarization and crisis. So this picks up again a little bit of uh, the work from Charles Worth that I mentioned in the last slide. Um, but I think the COVID-19 uh, moment really does ask us some serious quest questions about how we frame security and insecurity. Uh, how we respond to crisis and uh, where we see the kind of most effective mechanisms for that. Uh, and I think much of the work that we're doing at SOAS is already looking into and responding to uh, global insecurity in important ways. Um, and it is a reminder that actually the best way to understand insecurity, crisis and militarization is to go to those places where that how uh, is experienced and understood firsthand rather than theorizing it from the kind of position of the global north where the solutions have been ineffective uh, again and again in gendered ways, in racialized ways, uh, in, 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 and uh, all the intersections along uh, the way. So, um, uh, I obviously could just keep talking. You might have picked that up. Uh, so I've got, but I'm going to end there. It's just a kind of taster for you. Uh, I think that you know, there's uh, hope that, that the Centre for Gender Studies uh, modules uh, allow both a theorisation, um, a kind of platform for different methodologies and ways of thinking about everything from security and, and insecurity to histories of knowledge. Um, to intersectionality, what we mean by gender, et cetera. Um, but in terms of the legal work in particular, I think what I'm most interested in working uh, with students is 
understanding that we already have significant gender law reform uh, in different international spaces, in different national spaces. You could think about where you come from, what legal jurisdictions you've lived in, and you can probably identify a handful of kind of uh, gender law reforms that have happened uh, around violence against women, perhaps around maybe a laws, uh, anti-discrimination laws. So I guess for me, one of the things we do at SIAS is think about in the, we live in a world where gender law reform has uh, happened, and some of it's happened, not all of it, obviously. How do we understand, critique, and appraise those laws? How is it that we still live gendered lives, that we see the gendered kind of power dynamics continuing to influence uh, different lives? So it's about situating legal uh, change within these kind of transnational feminist networks and asking how it is that the translation from feminist transnational network into law doesn't produce the kinds of changes that we were perhaps uh, hoping for. Personally, I'm interested in the nexus between feminist activism, protest, and policy. How do we move from the state of space of protest uh, to see a policy on the books, but yet the policy doesn't necessarily respond effectively to the original activism? And then some of the things that we've talked about already, uh, gender at so us is an interdisciplinary classroom, uh, and we mentioned this already. What do we mean by that? It's uh, not only a space where our students come from interdisciplinary backgrounds, but it's also a space where we probe at knowledge through intersectional and interdisciplinary approaches so that when we hold law, perhaps if that's the discipline that we're working within, we don't hold law as something separate to other kinds of disciplinary knowledges. In fact, we would interrogate law through uh, other disciplines, for example, history, um, gender, as all these courses do, uh, politics, IR, development studies, language or, or area studies and regional studies as well. But it's not just kind of bringing together an amalgamation of lots of dis different disciplines, it's interdisciplinary in the sense of what new knowledge do we produce when we sit between the disciplines and we can see one discipline from the perspective of interdisciplinary classroom. Not all the work that we do uh, is attention to transnational LGBTQIA and intersectional approaches. Uh, we have trans positive uh, center and law school um, and uh, we embed that in the knowledge frames and methodologies that we use across our modules. I think CGS offers, like most master's courses, a kind of combination of guided and independent study, and we love working with you all uh, to kind of make that happen. Uh, and beyond myself, who's an international law lawyer, there's a kind of wealth of regional expertise in the centre as well. And the last thing, which is kind of sliding off, which is amazing community of alumni, and there's actually a link when you get the slides, you'll see to the Centre for Foreign Policy. Sorry, it's the Centre for Feminist Foreign Policy, which was set up by one of my former gender and law MA students. I'm proud of them all. They go, you all go out and do such amazing things at the end of your degrees. Right, so uh, that's been about 45 minutes of me talking, which is probably more than enough for all of you. Um, so I am quite happy to take some questions now. Um, or, and I just put my email address in the chat box. You can also email me if you'd like to come up, come back to me with a question if it brings to mind later on. Happy to take practical questions or intellectual uh, kind of subject knowledge questions, uh, whatever whatever you might have. Um, so I can see there's a few of you still here. So if you've got a question, type away or um, pop your hand up or just shout out. I'm more than happy to answer your questions. Nope. No questions. I'll just quickly throw out an offer as well in case anyone has general questions about being a student at SOAS or choosing which degrees to apply for or what subjects and just general things. You're also welcome to ask those to me as well. That's been nice, Andy. And uh, um, I'm sure you'll take questions offline so that they know that I'm not telling you what to say. <laughs> or yes, I can pop my email address in too if that's helpful. Yeah. 
if you don't mind. I mean, yeah. I I think it can be a quite nice way to find out about different modules if you get in touch with one of our current students. I can also put you in touch with some of our gender studies students if you email me. I'm more than happy to do so. Okay. Great. Any questions? Uh, regarding applications, what do we look for in your in the personal statement and experience? Um, well, uh, for the most part, we look at um, your academic profile first of all, um, and then we will look to your personal statement to see uh, what your kind of motivation is for coming to CGS uh, or or to the law school. Uh, what kinds of things you've done in the past you think might inform um, your capacity for critical analysis or understanding of gender. Um, you know, there, I mean, it is really a personal statement. And we used to talk about this quite a lot in gender studies, about how deeply moving many of your personal statements were. And we felt we wished that we could put a book together of them all because um, you all come from such amazing backgrounds. Um, so I just encourage you to be honest. This is why I wanted to do this course. Sometimes it's like I don't really know much about gender, but there's something in me that's kind of bringing me here. Uh, other times it's more, well, you know, actually I've done this work in activism or policy space and I really want to think behind it. You know, whatever works for you, but I think we're just interested in that personal statement. Uh, any additional work that you've done, whether it's writing, analytical, activism, organizing you know it, it might be in gender might be around sexuality might be around race um you know you should also include that as well does that help great excellent so we've got time for a couple more questions if anyone uh, oh sorry um your mic isn't quite working okay no problem i'm quite happy to read the questions as they come through that's not a problem um, great. Any other questions? Okay, so if there's no further questions, I think we'll probably end. On the last slide, there's a short video. I'm not going to play it now, but you may have seen it already. It's on our front page for the Center for Gender Studies website. And it's just a handful of our current students talking. Uh, okay, I'll just go back to this question before I end, but make sure you do go and watch our video. We, we're really proud of it. In terms of academic profile, is that regarding modules and interests or regarding degree classification? Well, it's a little bit on both. We will look at your degree classification. Um, and we are an interdisciplinary centre, uh, so we do take uh, people from most uh, sort of backgrounds uh, in terms of academic profiles, but occasionally we'll get an application from someone that's come from a discipline that we feel is just a little bit too far from uh, what we would expect. So, for example, a kind of, uh, I, I guess, hard science background or, um, you know, a, a finance and management background where we, we just maybe would want to know more about what other work that they've done. Um, so that would be the only time we'd look more at the modules. But, um, you know, I mean, I'm sure you know, if you want to come back to me in an email and ask me about your specific case, um, but we'll first look at your classification and we'll look at the modules more broadly. But I wouldn't worry too much about that unless you're coming from uh, a kind of degree where perhaps you aren't writing long essays, uh, for example, mathematics. Oh, then we might want kind of a little bit more information. Uh, just to know that you're going to cope with the academic requirements of the course uh, first and foremost. So we might ask for a writing sample if we had any concerns, for example. But you can send in a writing sample from the outset if you prefer. Not necessary at this stage. Uh, no problem. Right. So as I was saying, uh, there's a video on our homepage for the Centre for Gender Studies. So I do have a look at some of our current students talking about uh, what they love about the degree and the different aspects of the different degrees that have a look at as well. Okay, thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, I'm probably going to end there.